If you look at your career and your life like that, like you're playing the long game and, and you just have a lot of things that you're throwing out there, well, fine, maybe nine of them are going to fail, but one of them is going to change your life and change your career. And so you just have to keep going until you hit that. And that's always been my philosophy. And you know, even today, I'm still working on projects that may or may not go anywhere, but I have enough of them at any time now that I, I feel confident enough that at least one or two things is going to work out. And so here we had this dilemma, this, this fact. fact. I spent almost a decade researching this subject. From the Hint offices in San Francisco, I'm Kara Golden. Every aspect of your metabolic health improves. Each week, we're talking to innovators and game changers who think outside the box and tackle problems that few address. What does it really take to be unstoppable? Let's find out. I'm so excited to share this interview with Randy Zuckerberg, founder and CEO of Zuckerberg Media. We dive into how her passion started in opera, her rejection from Harvard to major in music, the importance of asking for what you want, and of course, her time at Facebook. You're gonna love her story. Now sit back and enjoy the show. So excited to have Randy Zuckerberg here. So yeah, thanks. I'm so excited yeah. to be here. Yeah. This is incredible. Yeah, we're really excited to have you here. So, uh, so more than anything, I'm just really want to talk to you about Randy's journey and how did you decide to do what you're doing today. But let's back up a little bit. So you grew up here sure. in New York. Yes. First of all, I'm so excited because usually I'm the one doing the interviewing. I know. I know. So this is very so different for me to be on this side of the table. So thank you. So I grew up in a little town called Dobbs Ferry, New York, okay. and which is apparently now a super hipster town. Let me tell you, it was it was the opposite of hipster when I was growing up there. But now everyone's like, oh yeah, all the Brooklyn people are moving to Dobbs Ferry. So and uh, had a really nice upbringing in the suburbs of New York, but uh, I was always really passionate about theater. So I'd always try to drag my parents into the city to go to theater, and then I begged them to send me to a private high school uh, in the city mm -hmm. so I could do more with theater. And that was, kind of, that was my plan. That was the life dream. That was the path I was on. And then somehow I miraculously got accepted to Harvard University. And my parents were like, so yeah, you know that whole theater conservatory thing you want to do? No, you're going to go to Harvard. <laughs> Wait, so were you doing a ton of high school? A ton, plays? everything. And, yeah. Actually, opera was oh, my thing I was doing. Yeah. Um, I was basically living at Lincoln Center, trying to get, um, they had $5 student tickets at that time to all the dress rehearsals of the operas. I was kind of inventing my own independent studies, and that was my thing. And then. And then I went to Harvard and I got rejected from the music major there, which is so embarrassing. And that was, I guess, my first entrepreneurial pivot at age 18 was, you know, thinking I had my entire life mapped out for me as an opera singer and then realizing like, oh shit, I, have, I need a new life you plan. Yeah, that's that. right. Yeah. And so did you do other stuff on campus that, that was music related? I or? did. I basically still majored in music for all intense purposes because I sang a cappella. I still I did a lot with the student operas and uh, so I was really involved in theater but technically my major for the books was psychology interesting and so what do you think you liked about music I, I want to go back and especially for the high school college audiences yeah. that are hearing you talk about like you thought you were going to do something and then you pivoted and you know in some ways like I bet that was a huge rejection for you not to you know, totally. get into this great music program <laughs> that you thought you were going to be a part of. Like, what did you, what did you really like about it, and what did you think you were missing? Yeah. Well, the good news is that for someone who's been involved in music or theater, uh, you are no stranger to rejection. Mm -hmm. So, getting rejected from the music major at Harvard was, you know, rejection number one hundred in a long line of auditioning for parts and not getting them. And I, for me, I actually think that's one of the biggest things, reasons that I hope my own kids go into. The arts in some way because if you at age eight nine ten if you can get up and audition for a role not get it and still pick yourself up and go audition for the next one I think you can handle anything that business or life throws at you mm -hmm. 
And uh, that, that learning that grit and that confidence in yourself, that's like, you know what, they didn't pick me for that role, I still think I'm the best person for the next one, is something that I've taken with me my entire life, maybe a little irrationally uh, when I've gone into entrepreneurship, but um, that I've really carried those lessons of the arts with me my entire life. And how, I'm so curious, like, you have your own kids, I mean, what, how did your parents react to you not getting into these plays? Did they, you know, pat you on the back? Did they, you know, like what was their response to it? Do you remember? I don't know. I mean, I. It's funny. I think I kind of stumbled into a love of theater. Mm -hmm. um, my mom signed me up for piano lessons when I was in elementary school, mm -hmm. and I went to one piano recital, and one of the girls got up and sang, and I was like. I think I want to do that. Yeah. So I had an hour long piano lesson and I finally talked my piano teacher into reserving 10 minutes at the end for singing. And then a year later, we were doing 10 minutes of piano and 50 minutes of singing at the end. That's and uh, at that point, I think she recommended well, to my mom, you know, I think maybe your daughter has some other interests yeah. here. Um, ironically, my lack of proficiency in the piano was actually what got me rejected from the music major, so I probably should have spent more time on the piano. Um, but I do think, you know, there's something really special as a parent about nurturing, you know, seeing what a child is yeah. leaning into and nurturing that. Yeah, and I, I think it's really hard, too, because you, you watch your children not get accepted to something. That's right. And, you yeah, know, you, want to, you want to pick them up off the floor, right. but How they're not, yeah. Up? Right. I mean, I think you have to be there to encourage them, but at the same time, no one learns grit if you pick them up off the floor every time they fall. You 100%. Know? Yeah. And that's the thing that I think I hear this over and over again from entrepreneurs yeah. having, you know, whether you're, whether you were in the arts or you were an athlete, yeah. it's all of the same, like the same sort of lessons learned and that's sort right. of how your parents reacted to things. And it's not typically the parent who was saying, you know, you're the best, you know, go out and do it again. And they, yeah. they were completely wrong, right? It, it's people who were saying like, well, if you really want to do it, you've got to just go try again. And That's you've right. got to try again and just keep going. I remember specifically one thing that just really sticks out in, in my life is uh, in the sixth grade, I, came home and I told my mom that we, I was going to be in this holiday concert at school and she was like, well, are you having a solo? And I was like, no. I, she's like, well, go ask for a solo. And I was like, you can't just walk into like the music <laughs> teacher and say, I want a solo. You can't do that. And she was like, why not? Like, how do you think people get ahead in business? They ask for things. And That's so awesome. I just like really timidly remember. And I'm, I'm kind of a people pleaser, yeah. so this is, that was a really hard thing to do. And I walked into his office and I was like, excuse me, I would like a solo in the holiday concert at you know age 11 or whatever yeah. I was. And he was like, okay. And that, again, that was my first life lesson. And like, you don't get what you don't have. Like what the worst he could have said was no. That's awesome. But he said yes. That's and so that kind of set me up for a whole lifetime of just having the chutzpah, I guess, to, yeah. to try to ask for things that, uh, that so I probably funny. didn't even deserve. Yeah, <laughs> no, definitely. I have a similar story. So, but it's, it, it's uh, <laughs> you know, it's so true that I think you just do have to just go ask it and sort of have that mindset, like, what's the worst that's going to happen? And, yeah. and that's what you have to think about. So you, so you went to Harvard graduated a minor in, yes. in music? Um, yes, so I, I majored in psychology mm -hmm. and actually I kind of refer to that as one of my luckiest failures in life, not getting into the music major because if I hadn't majored in psychology, then I would not have uh, gone to work in an ad agency and started to develop some expertise in digital marketing. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for that, then I wouldn't have gotten into Facebook in Silicon Valley. So I moved uh, back to New York. I worked at an advertising agency called Ogilvy & Mather. And uh, on my first day in the agency, everyone else who was starting that day got staffed on these glamorous campaigns with celebrities, except for me. I got staffed on this brand new team called Interactive and Digital Marketing. And I called my mom and I cried. I was like, I'm in a dead end job. I don't know what this digital marketing thing is. I don't want it. I want to be with the celebrities on the set of like Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. I think like four of my <laughs> friends got staffed on that. And um, 
And then two years later, they were still getting coffee on television sets. And our little team was the, you know, bringing in tons of revenue. So, awesome. so again, I feel like a lot of the things in my life that seemed like failure or rejection or bad news at the time wound up being just the things that I thank my luckiest stars for in my life. So, and why did you... I think I know the answer, but why did you continue? So you were given this role in the, you know, interactive marketing group. And why did you, you call your mom and, and <laughs> cry? And then you just decided to go back in the office and stick with it. I mean, I was 22 years old. I didn't have that much uh, market power or negotiating leverage yet. And, you know, I was my first job out of school and basically, you know, my mom and everyone else that I talked to was like, well, you got to pay your dues. You work hard. You, you know, work really hard on whatever team you're staffed on so that when you do have the marketing leverage and the experience, then you pick. Yeah. And that's something to be totally honest that I wish more people kind of, uh, I feel like in my career, like I spent a year basically making photocopies. Mm -hmm. You know, like a Harvard educated degree making photocopies and working, you know, 20 really plus hours, like working really hard, making no money. But I also think that that set me up to be able to appreciate great jobs that I had later in life mm -hmm. and great companies and great bosses. And that's something that I sort of, when I looked around in Silicon Valley and I saw all of these people fresh out of school working at companies that had like free gyms and chefs and everything, I was like, I just feel like you don't quite understand yeah, how good you, you have it. Yeah. yeah you like you missed. missed that critical step of like paying your dues. Yeah, totally. <laughs> no, I was living here in New York and working at Time magazine and my <laughs> first job I was making twenty four thousand nine nine five a year. Yep. In New York City. <laughs> and that was really tough. And so every day I remember like going around and asking if there were any leftover sandwiches from the executives' lunches because they would, you know, have meetings in the lunchroom and there'd be like this whole tray of food and I'm like, just save me anything. Yeah. And then my friends would come over to my house and I'd be like, here's all the leftovers, here's <laughs> roast beef and turkey and everything and everybody's like, Wow, totally. like make sure that next time they order from Manja and all these, like we knew all of the restaurants that they were like ordering from, but it was fun. Like, and, and what's ironic, I mean, these are the people that, I mean, we actually just hired a person to come back and do some contract work for us, but it's just, it's like those days when it was really us just being scrappy and you knew who the smart people were, you knew who the hard workers were. Yeah. Like, I think that that's the thing that I always say too, especially in Silicon yeah. Valley, that there's a lot of people trying to take shortcuts along the way. That's right. And they're not, you know, and you don't really know who the people are that are really smart and who are really dedicated and who are really scrappy in those cases yeah. where they're able to kind of hide behind that's right. I feel like the media ease. really makes it seem like there are these overnight success stories. Mm -hmm. Like someone just went from, you know, having an idea to turning around and yeah. selling it totally. for millions and millions of dollars. But I feel like every overnight success story that you see was 20 years in the making totally. of someone just yeah. pounding the pavement. Or somebody has that story where there was like definite grit. There was yep. definite, you know, like it was hard. Absolutely. It was su super, super hard. So, okay. So you're at Ogilvy. Yeah. And then it, so the next step was? So the next step, I did a brief year at Forbes actually, oh. which was pretty cool um, down in downtown New York. Um, but it was around, I didn't know that. yeah, I did. Yeah, it was I like a so. one year yeah. stint, um, which again was kind of fun because, um, they, I guess, uh, they decided that they were going to do a television show on Fox while I was there called Forbes on Fox. It was on at five o'clock in the morning on Saturdays. And um, it was like four old dudes yelling at each other about conservative topics. Yeah, <laughs> you and everyone in America, but that's okay because what ended up happening when I got, when I went to Forbes, they were like, okay, you're working on television. You're working on this show. And I'd never worked on anything on TV before. So I was like, all right, great. I'm going to work on this. But then a year later, when I went to Facebook and they started saying things like, does anyone in this company have any television experience? Then. I was like, 
me, I guess I do, and that's how I started running all of our media, all of our politics partnerships, anything that touched TV media in any way because of that 5 a.m. Forbes on Fox show. So was that your first job then at, at Facebook? My first job, I joined, there were about 12 people when I joined the company, oh, so crazy. it was um, every job, everyone did Full disclosure, every Mark job. is your brother. Yes, Mark so, is yes. my brother, and uh, he called me around that time that I was at Forbes, and he was like, hey, Randy, I could really use someone who knows digital marketing, which really meant that he needed someone who would almost work for free, and he just like <laughs> knew to call me because I was Why his sister and I worked in digital marketing, right? Yeah. He's like, who do I know that That's I can get to work for free who like knows digital marketing? Mark, she's on to you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, you know, I feel like I was, you know, I. I didn't, I wasn't married, I didn't have kids, like I was up for a life adventure. And so I thought, okay, I'll go out to California and see what's yeah. going on out there. Um, and it was really exciting. I mean, I very quickly just got very excited about the world of entrepreneurship. Were they in Palo Alto? Was that They were in Palo yeah. Alto. Yeah. And it was just so different from anything that I'd ever seen in corporate America, yeah. where, you know, in corporate America, the one great thing about it is that you know exactly where your career is going to be in 10 years yeah. from now. You're like, if I work hard for two years, I'll be this position and then I'll be this. Um, and all of a sudden I saw this kind of free for all world yeah. where you could bypass years of your career and have decision making power. And, you know, who knew if it was going to work out or not? But that was the exciting part. So um, and do they have an office? Yeah, they had, they had a little office yeah. at that part. Uh, they, the company had just raised a Series A f of financing, so we really quickly went from about a dozen people to about 50 people. And uh, that was, it was really exciting early days, but I definitely relied on the, um, what I'd learned at Ogilvy and at Forbes. And if, you know, without those building blocks early on in my career, I don't think I would have been, had the confidence to raise my hand and, and take on the things that I did at Facebook. So I'm so curious, what did your parents say about you going and working with your brother? I have, I have uh, kids, I have four kids very close to one yeah. another. And I could imagine two of my kids in particular doing, like their skill sets are so different. Totally, well don't you think, I mean, isn't that every parent's dream that like your kids get along so well yeah. that they then wanna, you know, professionally work together? But were, were they nervous? Like I, I think I would be slightly nervous, like hoping that, you know, this was all gonna yeah. end up okay, right? Like for the, you know, the, I mean, I think they were nervous for Mark. He's the one who dropped out of school. Yeah. I at least like had a Harvard degree. <laughs> if all of this didn't work out, I you know could at least like I had like I had a, a resume with experience on it and a Harvard degree. Yeah, but here you I, are, <laughs> like leaving a job in New York to go to San Francisco. Yeah. Right. Like as a mother, I think okay. I would be like. Okay, are you sure about this? Like, I want to be nice to Mark, but like, are you sure you want to pick up yeah. and leave? I mean, no, I mean, that's a big move. It was definitely hard, um, but at that point, I had we have another sister who is at school in Chicago, and a younger sister who is in school in Pasadena. So everyone was kind of already yeah. scattered to the wind. It's like, why not also San Francisco? Like my parents were already circling the country every yeah. few months, so why not? Yeah, but I mean, just two <laughs> siblings. You know, it's like taking a risk together. Yeah. Right. Like I, I think, think it's a great thing. I think it's amazing, but it's also so scary. Yeah. So I have to interview your mom about this yeah, to definitely. understand. Like like yeah, understand uh, like would she be I don't know because I've I've definitely you know thought about that that it like would you I, we get asked my husband and I work together yeah. so we get asked all the time like do you ever worry about like both of you being you know at risk to, together <laughs> and I, I don't really view it yeah. that way instead I just view it as we're doing something together that is going to make a big difference totally but it's just the way that you know people see the world, right? Yeah. And what their fears are, right? That's right. And, so, anyway. and I think some, I mean, that's like the first rule of entrepreneurship is that there are no rules, right? Yeah, some people, like, for everyone who tries to tell you don't work with a close friend, mm -hmm. there's, you know, 10 examples of startups founded by best friends or like don't work with a spouse. There's, you know, amazing examples like you. Totally. And um, so I think it's just 
because it's the Wild West, yeah. you just have to yeah. go with your gut and Who see what it? feels right. Uh, Dry Bar, too, was a brother yeah, and sister. Yeah, it's a brother and yeah. sister yeah, company. Yeah, yeah. So, you it's know, I'm sure I'm sure there are also lots of family businesses out there that end in, you know, brothers and sisters never speaking to yeah. each other again. But um, that's why I think you have to understand your own, yeah. you know, your, your own family dynamic. So what do you think was the biggest surprise when you went to Facebook? Um, I think the biggest surprise, honestly, if we're like going to kind of immediately go there, was um, the kind of the role of women in tech in Silicon Valley. Because here I had just come from this world where I think college in America today is majority women. I, you know, and I think, um, and the, certainly the media world where I worked you know, didn't feel like there was a glass ceiling. At Ogilvy & Mather, uh, Shelley Lazarus, one of the first, you know, Fortune 500 companies run by a woman, like that was the first woman I worked for right out of school. And then um, Forbes was, you know, had great gender diversity. And then all of a sudden, I went from kind of saying, well, there's no such thing as the glass ceiling clearly, to landing squarely in a world where I was the only woman in the room for 10 years. Crazy. And that was really a very eye-opening experience because I truly had believed there was no more glass ceiling. Yeah. And um, all of a sudden, I hit it. Yeah. That was, I think, one of the biggest things. Every single day that I worked in Silicon Valley, I was aware of my gender. Yeah, interesting. And so wait, what year was this? What? This was, uh, it was 04. 2004 yeah. that I moved out to Silicon Valley really and uh, and I was there until 2015 yeah. that I lived there but 2004 I'm just trying to think so you have you know Google it was kind of right? like the dawn yes. of social media yeah, at that time totally. like YouTube was just gonna start yeah. a year or two later you had you know all like Twitter was gonna start about two or three years after that it was Such kind of the the dawn time. of the of the social media generation but still to this day, I mean, you can really count on your hands the number of prominent women in, yeah. in tech. No, absolutely. It's, it's crazy. So you're, so you're at Facebook and then uh, you decide to leave and you did a couple of, you, I feel like you went back to sort of your passion yeah. of, you know, theater and TV. That's right. Well, I have, to, I have to say that my passion always kept creeping into yeah. all the work that I did. Yeah. So one of my fun projects on the side was I helped found a, an employee band. We, we were an 80s rock oh, cover band of all employees who worked I, I at Facebook. This. And yeah. we used to play at charitable events around Silicon Valley and different tech companies. I so. went to one of your yes. concerts you invited me I to. I mean, it was our really motto fun. was we play for free and you get what you pay for. So like, we're not the best band in the world, I want to say. But that's so okay. You in Silicon band? Valley has kind of lower yeah. standards. Boys. Yeah, you were yeah. there. Yeah. That's, um, that's awesome. And so I, there were two singers. Um, there was me and then there was a guy who worked in HR and recruiting at Facebook, and we were the, kind of the two lead singers. So he was, he basically did, he, like Bon Jovi was his specialty. Yeah. So we basically did like the entire Bon Jovi collection. So is this still going else. on? Like I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think it's still going. I don't think anyone has picked up the gauntlet after I left. Um, but I also, because I always had that inner performer in me, I was able to really put myself in the mindset of, all of our users out there in the world who kind of all had that performer inside of them. And so one of the projects that I'm most proud of inside of Facebook was creating Facebook Live, which now almost uh, over Amazing. a billion people around the world use on their phones. And I feel like what really sparked and motivated me to do that was kind of realizing, well, like everyone has this inner performer and what would happen if you gave everyone an outlet to speak directly to one another and have their own shows. And, and so that, uh, that was really an exciting project and a meaningful project for me to work on. But I think it also showed me that um, I had all of these unfulfilled passions around performance that I just, I wasn't realizing in Silicon Valley and uh, that ultimately I just, New York City was calling me back. Yeah. That's, a, that's so awesome. So you, <laughs> so you decide to come back to New York and was there a particular, besides the calling, was there a reason? Yes. Because your parents um, moved out. My parents, everyone in my family moved out of New York. I guess they finally got tired of the cold. Um, but in 2013, 14, I guess it was, um, I got cast in a Broadway show 
which which was, was really cool rock of ages yes, 80s amazing. rock see calling on all yeah. that feed bomb experience that was our 80s rock band and um it's funny because when they called me about the part they were like so we saw some YouTube videos of you singing with some 80s rock band. And uh, I was like, don't watch those that videos. So, funny. <laughs> so you didn't go through, you didn't just go try no, out like on a I didn't Saturday try out. or no, whatever? No, um, they just called me. They said they were looking to do some new stunt casting for the show to That's bring in kind of a, a techie audience. And that was kind of the Pandora's box. Was that, that just a dream of yours? Like it was you must have been dying no, I mean, when they I called still, you. <laughs> I still sometimes have to check in with people who saw it to make sure it actually happened, and I didn't dream it because I, I feel like it. You know, like you're going through your whole career. I worked in technology. Yeah. I was out in Silicon Valley. I'm like, did I did I dream that? Yeah. Like, did I actually? You know wear a sparkly thong leotard and bucket perform. Bucket <laughs> like, like when people asked you about like, what do you really oh, yeah, want to no, do? But it's like one of those things that was so thought. high on the bucket list that you just like, <laughs> no, you're like, it's just, it's, it's just stuck happen. there. It's, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, so I was, great. I thought that like maybe one day I could um, pay enough at a charity yeah. auction to have like a walk on yeah. role yeah. on stage and so uh, in a show, but I never thought I'd actually have a lines to speak. That so. is so great. And you um, were on for a while. Yeah, I was I mean, on. Was um, like yeah, I was on for performances. You were, thirty performances, yeah, I mean, and actually, uh, it would have been longer. I got an offer to extend, except I was uh, twelve weeks pregnant with my second son. And just, uh, was crazy. which was was crazy, and I was already worrying that maybe I was like, gonna blow his eardrums out with all that loud '80s yeah. rock music and like doing splits and stuff like that. So I was like, okay, I think it's time to uh, take it easy a little bit. But um, but yeah, so that was 2014 was an embarrassment of riches yeah. of wonderful yes. things happening, um, and then the following year we decided to move to New York permanently. Because you just, yeah, you just decided it was time to yeah. come out there. And so you continued your love of the theater, though. I mean, most recently we were talking about Dear Evan Hansen. Yes. Well, now, you know, luckily I kind of got the performing yeah. out of my system. Now I'm more on the business side of theater. So helping to uh, fund different shows on the producer side. I've joined two theatrical boards that I'm really excited about. I'm on now. I used to... I, I was telling you how I used to uh, go to the Met to see all the operas when I was in high school, and I just joined the board of directors of Lincoln Center. Oh, that's amazing! Um, which is really that's exciting, so and um, and on the board of the American Theater Wing, which runs the Tony Awards. So now it's fun. You know, sometimes your dreams are even bigger than you think. You know, I used to think like if only I could just be on stage, and I'm like, if only I could run all of yeah, theater. Okay. Well, and I think your experience must be so helpful today because you've done operating business roles and you've also been on the front end of actually performing Absolutely. and now you know you can actually look at all sides of what's really needed in order for a production to be successful. Absolutely. It's just like when you pick, if you're an entrepreneur and you pick which investor to go yeah, through, 100%. do you want to be with the investor who's just sat behind an investing desk their whole life and written checks? Or do you want the investor who's actually rolled up their sleeves and been an operator and has seen all sides of your business who can help you? I feel like it's the same thing for me. I don't see how I could credibly uh, be on the business side of theater without having done all the other roles that I've done. A hundred percent. And I think what you're saying is so true. I was just telling an investor, not related to Hint, but somebody who was putting a fund together. And I said that if I were you, I would really put people on as part of this, even if they couldn't afford to put money into yeah. a fund, but to have operators. Because Absolutely. as an entrepreneur, I want to work with people who have done everything yeah. on there. And I think it's probably too for people who are going to be joining a production, right? Like That's the right. really good people can join probably a few different productions. Absolutely. And so you need to be able to have that background of people who really get it, which yeah. clearly... Clearly you do. So uh, so I can't say it's the next venture because I think you're still you're still on Dear Evan Hansen and it's going amazing, right? And so but uh, on a parallel path yes. above and beyond being you have 
two kids? Right? I have two kids, two yes. Kids. yes. So how did I wind up in children's entertainment, so, which yes. is where I am now? Because you're like, OK, I, you're like, I think this career was starting yes. to make sense. See, that's the thing I love. Just when it's starting to it. make sense, yeah. I'm like, yeah, no, now I'm over here. Now I'm over here. here. So um, but I think the one thing that ties it together is I was mentioning you know, feeling really hyper aware of gender in Silicon Valley. and so. That was one thing that I started thinking about a lot was how do we change this? How do we make it so that you know the next generation of young women are not the only woman in the room mm -hmm. in tech? Um, and I sat in so many rooms where people were like, just force computer science in school or do this or do this. And I was like, I don't, I don't think that's the answer. And then I kind of thought about theater and everything. And I was like, I think that content and pop culture is the answer. I really think, I mean, look at a show like Hamilton and how that's created such a resurgence in people wanting to study American history. Mm -hmm. um, I was like, I think if you can just infuse women in tech and engineering into pop culture and the arts, I think that will change the game. So I, after, uh, everything in Silicon Valley, my first thing, I actually wrote a children's book called Dot, which mm -hmm. is now um, a television show all around the world. Thank you. We're starting to go into production on our second season now, which yeah. is really exciting. So I've written uh, another children's book since then, and my newest venture, which is called Sue's Tech Kitchen, is a restaurant experience that uh, is uses food and the kitchen to get kids excited about tech and science. Exactly. So you can come in and you can make edible slime. We have these kind of inflatable balloons that you can eat. We have robots making pancakes and 3D printed s'mores. And you're getting lessons in tech and science in a way that's accessible and fun for the whole family. So for me, everything that I do these days is around combining kind of theater and content and trying to get more girls into tech. And love of learning. And a love of right. learning, I, yeah. It's so clear. I think I you know, you can force kids to do things in school till you're blue in the face, mm -hmm. but if you don't make it fun and delightful and exciting, it's never gonna stick. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And I think that the other thing that you're really doing is you're sharing your love of storytelling mm -hmm. in addition throughout all of these, you know, and which I think whether it's a book or it's, you know, theater or you know, working at Facebook, it's like you're continuing to take it from one step to the next step wow. and bringing it to everything that you're doing next. That's right. So Theater cool. can kind of, it can be in everything. Um, and that's one of, been one of my favorite things in my career is I've gotten to tell stories on all sorts of mediums. And I've also had the opportunity to create brand new mediums yeah. to tell stories that never existed before. And that's been just incredibly rewarding. That's so cool. So, and Sue's Kitchen is, uh, is in Roosevelt Island. Yes, it's, yeah. uh, it's in the new um, Cornell Tech campus on Roosevelt Island, which is beautiful. It's a new uh, tech hub uh, in New York City. It's really gorgeous. And you take the tram over. Yeah, you can York? take yeah. Uh, the, tr the tram over. You can take the subway, the ferry. There's all sorts of fun transportation That's modes so to get there. This incarnation of Sue's Tech Kitchen is just a pop-up. It's our, our second pop-up, actually. Our first is in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and then this is our second. And after this, we're going to tour it oh, all around the country. So, so we're finalizing our list of cities now. And when do you think that'll start? I think it'll start pretty soon, February, March oh of next gosh. year. That's... I told the team they can have a few weeks in January to, to relax, and then we're like back on the road. That is know? so great. So it'll be uh, like a... like on wheels i mean yeah you know, basically yeah. on wheels and for me i mean i love being in new york city because i live here and it's fun and i get to you know invite all my friends to come but for me i think the big opportunity for something like sue's tech kitchen is going to rural areas and smaller cities where it's a family's first exposure to tech yeah you know, New York City, the kids come in and they're like, oh, that VR headset looks like the one I have at home. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, that's great. But, you know, you go to the middle of the country and families walk in and they're like, what is that? I've never seen that before. And, you know, if you introduce kids to something that they're not seeing at school, well, then maybe um, all the careers that are out there in cryptocurrency and robotics and AI suddenly don't seem so out of reach for them. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's so great. I'm so excited to see you do that because I think it's definitely needed. And right, instead of trying to hit people over the head, especially girls, to say like, go do tech, go do tech. Why don't you just show them 
what kinds of things they could be doing. Right, how really. it can apply to their lives and show totally. them, look, a lot of the things you're already doing involve tech and science and yeah. you just don't know it. And you just don't know it, which I think is so cool. Yeah. So what do you think are the biggest lessons if you look at, you know, Randy at age, you know, 11, 12, when, you know, she's not making certain plays, <laughs> right, that she really wanted to make, and, and now looking at where you are today, like, always smiling, no, I mean, I, I mean this. Like, you always have so much energy. You always look like you're having so much fun with what you're doing. What do you Thank think you. are the biggest lessons? I think one of the biggest lessons for me is that life is, is a volume game in mm -hmm. many ways. I think it can really feel easy when you're working on a project and you're consumed with it and it doesn't go the way you want to feel like, well, that's it. You know, that's the end. But, you know, when I look back on my life, I you know, I've worked on so many projects that failed, but you don't need, you only need one or two things that, that to work. To work. Yeah. And if you look at your career and your life like that, like you're playing the long game and, and you just have a lot of things that you're throwing out there, well, fine, maybe nine of them are gonna fail, but one of them's gonna change your life and change your career. And so you just have to keep going until you hit that. Um, and that's always been my philosophy. And you know, even today, I'm still working on projects that may or may not go anywhere, but I have enough of them at any time now that I, I feel confident enough that at least one or two things is gonna work out. So diversifying. Exactly, just like you would do with doing. your finances, yeah, yeah. you know, do it with your career. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I also think the other thing that I've really learned, and you're part of this learning, is that I spent so many years searching for like one mentor that was going to guide me through my life and my career. And I finally realized that that was kind of a waste of time because A, the career that I have didn't exist when those people, like nothing that we're doing existed before today. So how could those people even guide me? And B, they don't have the time, yeah. they're busy. And somewhere in the last few years, I realized that, wow, actually my best mentors are my peers that are sitting right next to me, that are going through the same thing of building companies, that are experiencing the same things we can bounce off of one another. And uh, by far and away, my best mentors in life have been my peers. That's awesome. Well, that is such a great note to end on. So that's amazing. Well, thank you so much, Randy. I appreciate thank it. You. We're going to continue this conversation. I'm going to get your mom. Yeah, at some point. I know. My <laughs> mom is way cooler than I am. And, and she has a really fun Brooklyn accent. I know. So you I might need it. a translator in the it. room. So, so great. Okay, cool. <laughs> thank and you. And uh, we're cheers. Can, yes, definitely. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Um, Where can everybody go? see the, the latest on yes. Soup's Kitchen. Well, so. shockingly, you can find me on social media. Yes. I know that might sound really yes. crazy, but yes, I am on Facebook and Instagram and yes. Twitter. Um, and suestechkitchen.com. You can uh, sign up if you're in the New York area and you want to get tickets cool. or follow our tour. Um, you can I'm find excited. all the info there. Great. Okay. Thanks again, Randy. Thanks so much, Tara. Awesome. You can learn more about Randy Zuckerberg and the inspiring things she's doing with Zuckerberg Media on ZuckerbergMedia.com. I have a huge announcement. I love giving away things that are so dear to my heart, like Hint Water. So for the next three months, I'll be choosing five lucky listeners to win a year's supply. All you have to do to enter is go to Kara Golden, that's K-A-R-A-G-O-L-D-I-N.com slash iTunes and leave a meaningful review for the show. That's it. And if I see you tweeting it out and tagging me at Kara Golden, you will increase your chances of being picked. And please be sure to spread the word with your family and friends. And thanks for listening to Unstoppable with Kara Golden. Thanks so much for listening to Unstoppable. If you like what you heard, please help spread the word and leave us a review. You can also follow along with me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Kara Golden. Do you have a question for me or want to nominate an innovator to Spotlight? Please talk to me at karagolden.com. Until next time, be unstoppable. Addictive nature of modern food. Of course, it's important. The obesity and diabetes epidemic. <laughs>